press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update. Namaste and I welcome you to this session of uh, weekly dialogues with Jaipur Dialogues and we have uh, Dr. C.K. Raju again with his history of science and maths in India and uh, this is the fourth session of that series and last time uh, we had stopped we were discussing the trigonometrical sign values and uh, from there we move on to calculus. So, so we were discussing trigonometrical sign values. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some of these things got lost. So let me share the screen and I hope it will come this time. OK, so this was what I was trying to show. Share. All right. So are you able to see this now? Let's wait a minute. Yeah. Yes. Ah, very good. Points. Excellent. OK, because it becomes a bit disconcerting otherwise. See, what I'm showing is just a simple table of sine values. This is x, and this is sine of x. And these are for the known values that uh, people learn in school, except that they are being written now in terms of uh, radians. And they are being sine of x is being written there, because radian is a natural measure. So apart from sine of x, I'm looking at the difference, looking at the difference quotient, and looking at the second difference quotient. Now, the point is that Aryabhat, if you recall, only gives sine differences. Because it is only those differences which come in for the calculation of sine values, numerical calculation. So that is very important. And the second thing that is important to note is the relationship of sine of x, the second difference quotient, because this is just a numerical table we have built. And it is clear that this column is very closely negative of this column. So 2588, but up to numerical errors, it is coming out to be very close. And so that is the central issue that we are, in effect, writing down some equation like this which we would write it down today in this form. But this D2Y, et cetera, there is no issue about infinitesimal. There is no issue about derivatives. It is all done in terms of finite differences like this, the second difference portion. So that is the starting point that he is doing this. And then the formula that I gave you earlier of uh, what Aryabhat is doing is that he is solving such a differential equation, it is effectively Euler's formula. It is the same as Euler's formula. And I think that's an important point, that it is not pre-calculus. It is calculus because this is the beginning of the calculus, and it is also the end. Solving a differential equation, according to me, is the beginning and end of calculus. You don't need the formula. You don't need anything. You just need to be able to solve. And for any kind of application, they're only going to be solving differential equations. So right. if you know how to do that, yeah. If you know how to do that, that is that is all of calculus. You don't need to be able to uh, have remember any formula or do anything. You should be able to solve this. And there are uh, this can be quite easily done on a computer. I can even show you a program which I have built to do it and which I used to teach it and so on. So that is all. So it is calculus. And the point is that calculus is being used to calculate trigonometric values. One of the questions that was in mind was, of what use is it? So it is being used to calculate trigonometric values because these trigonometric values are critical for issues like navigation. To determine latitude, longitude, to determine size of the Earth, you must have learned how you determine the height of a tree, at least theoretically, because you have to be able to measure uh, a real life angle, not an angle which is drawn on paper. A real life angle, let us say, angle subtended by the tree at my eye. So if you know how to do that, it, is, it could be any odd angle. So you should be able to calculate these sign values precisely. And this is where the calculus is being applied, because once you calculate the height of a tree, you can calculate the height of a mountain. And from that, you can calculate 
the size of the earth this is all explained in my school text a uh, very basic thing very simple ways of doing things uh, calculating the size of the earth and that is essential for calculating latitude and longitude so uh, that is essentially what is happening and uh, let us look at uh, 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 what happens after that uh, maybe i should give you i think it is in this let me share this uh, yeah let me share this so let me stop sharing this one and let me start sharing another tab which is um, where is it gone your share screen and look at chrome tab and all right are you able to see this yes it is there <clears throat> okay so uh, this is what aryabhat did now because this method is so crucial it's not like the geometrical method you know you are stuck to some simple angle you can do for any so the geometrical method and, will be applicable yeah. geometrical method will be applicable only uh, to straight what lines method? the geometrical method no no is applicable ah, geometrical only... method applicable only in, not to straight lines to cases of symmetry you want symmetry right for example right. 45 degree angle is a highly symmetrical angle so you know that both the sides are equal and so on and so forth but that's not the case in real life you can have a 1 and 1/2 degree angle a 2 and 1/2 degree angle and how will you calculate most students don't know it so in order to do that you have to have a technique of interpolation and extrapolation and what aryabhat does is to invent that technique of extrapolation he uses the rule of interpolation now where are these derivatives coming from these are just or difference quotient they are just coming from the rule of 3 you know the rule of 3 that if uh, five people can do a work in so many days and how many days will seven people do it you know that sort of thing which is a very elementary primary school thing that one learns so it is coming as the unit rate of change and that is being applied and that is why you are getting a uh, difference quotient and because this method is so fruitful it could be developed and it could be made as accurate over a thousand year period this became an extremely accurate method uh, it reached the uh, what is called the third sex adjustment limit it took thousand years because perhaps there was no need for it why do you want precise values in a five decimal place precision seems good enough so if you want higher but it kept happening so what ishwar comes up with uh, values which are precise to the second sex adjustment minute so you have kala that the aryabhat gave then vikala and then tatpara which is what the uh, aryabhat school in kerala gives and this is what i am showing you just now this is the slope for the so called infinite series which is uh, here and how it is to be calculated so this is the translation this is the slope nihatya chapa vargena chapam tat tat phalani cha and so on and um, it is note please it is chap angle is a curve arc relative length of a curved arc it is not something between two straight lines so this is a calculation of that and i will give it to you in the familiar form it comes out to this infinite series with which people would be familiar and similarly you have a infinite series for the cosine and so on and so forth so point i am making is that it's the same technique which is working and now see how accurate sine values this leads to the same technique of solving differential equations which is developed over a thousand years which is still being used for rocket technology also you will use it for any kind of technology i mean all the problems that i did in stdac all application problems involved solution of differential equations of some form or the other let's do i the space to uh, make cross sink water so uh, this is this is the table of sign values now i do not know if it uh, makes sense to use shrestham nam varishta nam you say where is the theta where is the sin theta and so on so chale ho gajo nilo so these are uh, things in this is a different notation from aryabhat notation aryabhat notation was unique uh, this is the katapayadi system 
which is used uh, in the Aryabhat school in Kerala, a different way of representing numbers. And this is the representation of numbers that you have got. So, Shreshtam Nam Varishtanam is not a sentence in Sanskrit. It is a number, which means this number, this is the Kala, this is the Vikala, and this is the Tattva. And so these are the values. Now, you may not be familiar with sexagesimal arithmetic. So this may not make sense. What are all these numbers? What do they mean? So let me give you the table in decimal format. So these are the signed values that were given by Madhav in the 13th, 14th century. So this is about uh, 1,000 years after Aryabhat. So in, you go through various stages. And these are the differences. So you can see the level of accuracy, how accurate these things are, the sign values are. And you need that accuracy because if you are at sea, you are making calculations, you are looking at things, or you are measuring the size of the earth, a small error can get multiplied by a large number. So you need very precise values. There should not be any error in the values. So you need these things. And uh, this is what they were developed for, and it leads to, it is used in astronomy, it is used in navigation, used in lots of places. All right. So uh, similar thing comes from what is called, you have the Leibniz series and so on. You have the value of pi. So this is stated by, uh, this is from the <coughs> Aryabhatiya Bhashi of Nilakant, the commentary on Ganit 10. Uh, then how did the transmission take place to Europe? Uh, uh, all this uh, uh, yeah, calculation. Yeah. So we can. You yeah, had so a, that's the point. You had Bhaskara too. Then you had um, uh, Brahmagupta. Uh, then yeah. you had uh, Ma Madhava Sangam Gram. And then you had Nilakant yeah. and all these yeah. people. And I believe there were stages of transformation. There was first trans uh, trans transmission, the second transmission, then a third transmission. And the Europeans took all this uh, all, all this uh, uh, wisdom, all this knowledge, and never acknowledged it. Yeah. So I think that uh, if we uh, want to discuss the entire issue of the transmission of the calculus, transmission entirely, not just calculus. Calculus was specifically for the navigation problem that it was taken. So maybe we need to take a background to see how the transmissions took place earlier because they took place right. over a number of stages and right. uh, maybe we can take a look at that so let's take a look at that uh, i have a uh, thing prepared for that so let me chrome tab chrome tab okay oh here it is all right <clears throat> so we look at arithmetic and trigonometry. Of course, algebra also went, and probability and statistics also went. But you can't discuss everything all at once. Uh, by the way, I'm giving a lecture in JNU on statistics and probability sometime next week. Okay. So let's look at arithmetic and trigonometry. You know, you have to keep the discussion a little bit limited because these things are there. Key point I want to make is why did the transmission take? It's not just, you know, keep saying zero, zero, zero. That's a story that the West has told us. They found zero difficult. But nobody took the arithmetic from India just because of zero. They took it because it was very efficient. And I think that point needs to be clearly understood because the story of zero was on being repeated. I've tried to explain several times. It has not gotten across. So important point is that Indian arithmetic was very efficient. I'm just talking about arithmetic now. We'll come to calculus later. Simple arithmetic, multiplication, division, addition, and so on. What you learn in primary school, this was extremely efficient. Other people did not have that. We need to understand that. So uh, let's take the contrast that Roman arithmetic was very inefficient. All right. An uh, example which I keep giving, an interesting example, is whether you can write 1788 in Roman numerals. Would you like to try <laughs> or shall we <laughs> go to the answer straight away? It's not a very big number. 1788 is uh, you know, just a four-digit number in decimal notation. But in Roman numerals, it is horribly big. So this is the answer in Roman numerals. M, D, C, C, L, X, 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 V, I, I, I. So you need 12 symbols instead of four. That gives you an idea of why it is so inferior and inefficient. 
and this is just a representation of a number. There are many other problems. I think we discussed last time, 10 raised to 53, the idea of the luxion. How yes. would you write it in Roman numbers? Go mad. The world will come to an end. You have to invent a special notation, which uh, Romans did not do because they didn't have the need for that sort of arithmetic. So that was the place value system. Its value was that it enabled efficient arithmetic. And it was not possible in the Roman system. And uh, that is how it led to what are called superior algorithms. Now, the word algorithm comes from Alphorismi's Latinized name, Algorithmus. And that is because it first went from India to Arabs, to Baghdad, to the Beit al Hikmah. This happened in the 8th, 9th century. Actually, there would have been transmission even earlier to the Umayyads. But uh, we have the uh, definite information only in the case of the Abbasid Anand. For example, the uh, Panchatantra went to the Umayyads much earlier. There was transmission earlier, but it has not been properly documented. But in the case of Beit al Hikma, it has been properly documented because Al Khwarizmi wrote Hisab al Hind. So, right there, it's an acknowledgement that it is from him, and his name was Algorithmus or Algorithmus, and so these are called algorithms today. And he wrote this in 9th century. He also wrote about algebra, algebra wal mukabla. As I said, I'm not getting into all that. But the important issue here is that there's so much talk about what Greeks did, Greeks did this, Greeks did that, that the Arabs took arithmetic from Indians, not Greeks. Why? Because Greek arithmetic was even more inefficient than the Roman system. It was similar to that. So let's try to understand this. Because I don't know why somehow people are not understanding this. They keep they are stuck on the story of zero. We come to the story of zero. <clears throat> so let's look at multiplication. Simple thing, you learn it in primary school. Nothing very difficult about it. No calculus, no trigonometry, nothing. Just multiplication. So just multiply these two numbers. <laughs> so <laughs> now how are you going to do it? That question. You can't write one above the other, multiply x into i, x something, something. You can't do that. Right? The usual way in which you take two decimal numbers, write them down and do it, you just can't do it. And that's the thing. You can't, if you convert the whole thing into decimals, make the calculation in your head and convert back, that's not allowed. Okay, you do it the way Romans did. They did not know any decimal place value system. They could not convert and reconvert. So you can't do it. It's a very tough job. It's a very tough problem. That gives you an idea. It's only when you see how inefficient it was that you start realizing. Because you learn this in primary school, it seems very natural. You know, multiplying two numbers is not an issue. <coughs> so before multiplication, we need to take multiplication is very difficult in Roman English. Let's take addition, simple addition. So let's take uh, your uh, these two numbers and let's add them. How are you going to add? So now you have to understand the Roman system. They used an abacus. An abacus is an inferior method. The Roman system of arithmetic is designed around the abacus. So first thing, you write out the whole thing in full form. You're not going to use IX. You're going to use those large number of symbols, V, I, 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 four I's. Not nine like this, but nine like that. Then for each of these, you treat each of these as a coin or a counter. You know, you have L, X, V, I, etc. Like a coin. Put all the coins together. You're adding, only adding. Okay. All the coins together and then simplify. So if you have seven ones, you make one five. And if you have two, uh, one, uh, one V and two I's. And then if you have three V's, you make one X and one V and so on. Two else, you make one C, just like you know how you deal with uh, coins in the shop, and then you come across the sum, which is you know 107, which is such a trivial thing. You should be able to do it in its head, uh, in your head, and it takes such a lot of time. So that's how inefficient it is. If you want to multiply, you have to go through this same process 29 times. That is how inefficient it is. I think we need to understand that. Okay. The second issue that Indian arithmetic was very efficient. That is why it was taken. The second issue is that it was not properly understood. Now we are not talking about lack of understanding of calculus. That is of course there. 
Newton, my point would be, did not understand the calculus. Forget about discovering. And Europeans in general did not understand it. Uh, even now, whether they understand it or not is a point in question. Now, they have some kind of understanding, but for two centuries, three centuries, there was no understanding. So the lack of understanding at the level of simple arithmetic. All right. So where did Europeans get it? They got it from Arabs in Cordoba, Kurtaba, which was then under the Umayyad dynasty. And that's why they called it Arabic numeral. So we are worried about, oh, it should be Indian. That is not the critical issue of concern. The focus should be on the numerals part. Why? Because the word numerals shows lack of understanding. As if it is just a different notation. And that is what Herbert brought the numerals to. Uh, well, I'm saying Europe. I'm sorry, it should be Christian Europe. Because Spain is also in Europe. And Spain at that time was under Muslim rule. So Gerbert was a pope later on. So he was part of Christian Europe. And he brought it to Christian Europe. He was a very learned man by standards of Christian Europe again. And he had written a book on the Abacus. But what happened was that because he wrote such a book, he thought the only way to do arithmetic is to use an Abacus. <laughs> like today, people think only way to do calculus is d by dx, d by dy, and some integral sign, and so on. So he thought the same way that the only way to do arithmetic is to use an Abacus. So if it requires an abacus, well, some different type of numerals, it requires a different kind of abacus. That was his idea. And so he constructed special abacus. Right? This was the first uh, the system of uh, Arabic numerals when they went to from Cordoba to Christian Europe. And as you can see, he has a rough understanding of the place value system. So he even understands that zero means a blank space means zero. So this would represent such a number. He understands that. He understands uh, this kind of a thing. So he has some understanding of place value. But what has he lost? He has lost, by building an abacus, he has lost the efficiency of the algorithm, which was the critical thing. That he did not realize. And so he calls them Arabic numerals, as if there is some magic in the shape of the figure. So he did not understand the idea that you have to throw away the backers. It took 500 years for Europe to understand that. And you have to do. Second stage. So this was uh, what Gerber did. He didn't understand. He threw it away. He made it. He didn't see any point to it. It was Fibonacci. So he was the son of a Florentine merchant and went to Africa and traded there. And there were Muslims there who were familiar with the writing of Al Khwarizmi algorithms. So he wanted. Why did he want? Because it is a comparative advantage in commerce. If he was a merchant, he's engaged in commerce. If somebody fools you, makes a quick calculation, gives you some decision to make, how do you do it unless you are able to make quick calculations? So he learned. Learned it and he brought it back to Christian Europe again which was uh, Liber Abaki. That was the book that he wrote. Again, there was lack of understanding. Because always when knowledge goes from one part to, the, to another, there is very often lack of understanding. So Roman numerals, as we saw, are like coins. What do you do with zero? No coin for zero. No place. You not, can't hold it in your hand. So people were Florentines. Were and practice, what is this zero? It has no value in itself. It adds any amount of value to the preceding number. So you had only one there, and now suddenly it has become 100,000. And zero has no value, and you go on adding it, adds any value. They were extremely puzzled. And uh, that is why they uh, had a problem. And the further problem was that because you can do that, so they passed a law against zero. That's why they keep celebrating zero. They passed a law against it. <laughs> in the year 1300 or 1299, they passed a law against it. Any financial <laughs> contract, you can change it. Because in Roman numerals, you can only add some I, I, I at the end. Hmm. But uh, here, you can add zeros. So contract was for 100 rupees. It suddenly becomes a lack of rupees or a crore of rupees, and you're sunk. So they wanted to stop that. They said, if you are using these dirty Arabic numbers, you must write it in words. And we still follow that. 
that Florentine law we still follow. At any contract, of course, now it's in the age of computers, so you're just doing all transactions online. So you just have to enter. If you make a mistake, you make a mistake. It's too bad. But you had to do it in words. So checks, you sign, you fill in the amount in words. That is coming from that Florentine law against zero. And we still follow that. So point is lack of understanding. I give a third example because at that time, only the Florentine merchants used it. This was not widespread in Europe. They treated it as a sort of trade secret. But Clavius, because by the time of the 16th century, they understood, the Jesuits understood, the church understood that arithmetic is an important skill. That if you want to navigate, you want to go there and you want to get wealth back, you must know basic arithmetic. And therefore, they introduced the arithmetic, practical arithmetic. Their idea of mathematics was quite different. Something to do with geometry and so on. So practical arithmetic, that was the name that Clavius gave. And he introduced this. So when he did that, and this was imported directly from India because the Jesuits were sitting right in Cochin. They had a college there. And they had the support of the local Syrian Christians. And they were collecting things. They were translating them. And they were sending them back. Clavius was a Jesuit general. So he was the first recipient of these things. He published trigonometric values in his name. He wrote this book on practical arithmetic. The point I'm making again is that there was, again, a lack of understanding. How do we know that this lack of understanding? Because there was another thing that was missing. Roman arithmetic does not have fractions. You can't say i upon x, i upon p, or you know, worse, say i x upon x and cancel out the x. You can't do that sort of thing. And no way to represent fractions and no proper concept of fractions. And therefore, you see this effect even today. Because Clavius was the person who carried out the Gregorian the form of the calendar. It should be calendar, not calendars. So uh, it uses leap years. It does not use fractions. See, the right way of staying it, stating it would be, this is the duration of the tropical year, 365.242. Or what figure that he used, 365.241. And this is copied from an Indian text, but let it pass for the moment. I think I have shown some of these things in many other places. Point we are talking about is the, at that point of time, 1582, when the Gregorian reform was carried out, there was no clear knowledge of fractions in Europe. So instead of saying that the year is so many days, fractions of days, use the system of leap years. So it is one day more than 365 days in four years. We're coming to something like 365.25. Right. Then you would say it is one day less than 100 years. So that's 365.24. And then you will say it is one day more than 1,000 years. See, leap year. So you have every fourth year is a leap year. And every 100th year is not a leap year. And every 1,000th year is a leap year. In order, uh, I'm sorry, whatever written, I've written 354. It should be 365.24. I don't know these days I make such mistakes. It should be 365.241. So that's the figure that he's arriving at. And uh, that is to say that the figure that he comes up with, 365.241, is correct only on a thousand year average. If you're doing it on a thousand year average, you see it is like crossing a stream whose average depth is two feet. <laughs> it may work, it may not. <laughs> Maybe if it is 10 feet deep in some place, then you will drown. So the point I'm making is it was still a very primitive system that they were following in 1582. And uh, of course, we are still committed to using that primitive system and we rejected our own sophisticated calendar. So there were these difficulties at every stage in getting this knowledge from uh, India and understanding. And the similar thing happened in the case of trigonometry. Again, let me give a very simple example. The very word trigonometry, and some people will try and make things like trichonmiti. But there is no trichonmiti in uh, ancient times in India, you don't find it. What you find is circle. So these are all concepts related to the circle, not to the triangle. So to relate it to the triangle, it's itself wrong. That itself is an error. 
because it's all about measuring the circle. Where does the value pi come in? All your sine function, cosine, there is pi somewhere. The pi comes in because of the circle. It can't just come in otherwise. And the very term that is used by Aryabhat, I think I showed it to you, Kalardhaja. So Ardhaja is what he calls it, it's half chord. Which is defined in a circle. To define half chord, you must have a circle. So they are circular function. This is very central. A circular function. They're not trigonometric function. They don't make sense. You know, how will you define sine of 92 degrees? Define it in some complicated fashion. There's no natural definition. Unless you are in a circle. In a circle, you can define it to any value. So this other jiva became jiva. As I saw, I showed you in that uh, thing, jiva pyai. So it went to Arab says jiba. So there's no word sound in Arabic. And it was written without muktas. You know, the consonant of skeleton, the way you write SMS. So it was written as ja and ba. So if you write PLS, you know, please understood. But what is ja and ba? So the illiterate people did not understand it. They said there must be some common meaning to it. What is the common meaning? Common meaning is jeb. As I have got a pocket, it's a jeb. And pocket that should be and sinus fold so if you see the oed i've got the oxford english dictionary on the word sign right so the upper part of a cloth is where you it's a hanging fold where you keep uh, your money or whatever and that is what sinus is and that is where the word came from from the arabic jeb so jiba turned into jeb, turned into sign, sinus turned into sign, and we are still copying the whole thing. <laughs> right? That is what is happening. It is so funny if you start uh, thinking of it and going into details, but that is what it is. All right? <laughs> it's a foolish Western mistake because it has nothing to do with jeb. So uh, similarly, you know, you have. Uh, important point other important point is that the very fact that there was no word for trigonometric function that this word was taken from arabic jib and a silly mistake was made there that itself shows that it could not trigonometry could not have been of greek origin but you have got influential historians and greeks anyway didn't know fractions how could they do something complicated like trigonometry i mean maybe egyptians had it maybe the iraqis babylonians had it but certainly the greeks didn't have it but you have dishonest historians like david pingri who say indians got trigonometry from greek but how did the greeks know about it so we have to understand these kinds of tricks that are done where a transmission is claimed on no basis almost so there's a basis of course there would be some text which says something so this gives you another route of transmission but this time it is from India to Greece, not the other way around. Why? Why do I say that? Because we saw that Indian texts are translated into Arabic from at least the 8th century and even earlier. But then these Arabic texts were later translated to Byzantine Greek. Okay. For example, the Panchatantra. Panchatantra was translated from Arabic to Greek. First, it was translated from Sanskrit to Arabic and to Syriac. So Syriac to Greece, yeah. very easy to do. And it was done. And it was translated around the 11th century. And then Latin and so on, Aesop's fables are from there. From so this is a concrete example. But there are lots of such texts which are translated. So the fact that you find a text in Byzantine Greek does not mean it has no input either. I mean, they recognize it has lots of inputs from Arabic. And if it has inputs from Arabic, then since Indian inputs went to Arabs, it really will be there. So later day, Byzantine Greek texts were accretive. Now, in India, you can avoid that accretion process. Because if you find a commentary written, for example, Neil Kant is writing Aryabhatiya Bhashya. What he will do is he will quote the original. And then he will give his commentary. So there's a very clear distinction between the original and the commentary. In the case of Greek, you just have one text. You just have one book by some guy called Ptolemy. You don't know whether he existed, did not exist, who wrote, when they wrote, and why they copied it out. So you just have one muddled up text which does not separate the original from the commentary. And everything is lumped into it. And then you say, oh, you find this text in the 12th century. But it was written sometime long back. And therefore, there was transmission to 
India, when it was actually the other way around. So these late Byzantine Greek texts are not uh, able to, uh, are not proof of anything, but this kind of thing still happening. So I think that um, uh, uh, when we look at uh, some of these issues, uh, maybe we can also look at what happened to the calculus transmission. The calculus right. transmission. So I think what we'll do is that we'll interrupt this session now. Okay. Okay, yeah. And then we'll discuss in the next session, we will discuss calculus transmission, what Newton got wrong, and then uh, how the things moved into the modern science and maths and what is happening now. So that will conclude the series. So okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, enlightening session. And then we meet again to go to the concluding session. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Okay.